I don't understand what gay people want from me. But I remember being 16 and going, you know, I am totally gay. It's not going to be easy. Get in the way. Get in trouble. Good trouble. The baby bushes have done a lot of damage, if you ask me. Dr. King would have said that we don't have a right to discriminate against any person. Did you ever say to Ronald Reagan, I, I may this have... disease is going out of control? I sent memos on AIDS. The president's an interesting person. I served with him for six years. He himself is not a bigot. Finally said it, that you get special rights if you're straight and married. Are you looking for a revolution? We didn't wait for someone to tell us to do We just did it. Max, welcome to the Thank show. You. I'm so happy you could join us. It's good to be here. So, Max, this is my, well, first of all, we're on the set of Will and & Grace, and that's, so, it's so exciting. Here it's in are. its eighth year. Yeah, we start tonight, our first episode of the eighth, eighth and final season. Just amazing. Yeah, I know. In creating Will and Grace with your partner, David Cohen, what you did is from the moment it was created and you pitched it and got it on network TV, really for the first time in television history, you broke open the doors to have a gay content show that wasn't one dimensional, that had true characters. And I think of you not only as a friend, but frankly, as one of the most powerful young moguls in our time in Hollywood. And what I would like to do with our conversation today is really have you look at what will ultimately be your legacy, what Will and Grace has meant to America, but also when you're 90 years old and look back. Um, to I, me, I, I, I hope I don't look back and say I was a mogul. <laughs> I, I, do, I do hope that. But well, that's interesting. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, well I, all, that's stuff that's put on to myself and it's put on to David and it's not really what it has ever been about, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm very, very uh, aware of and appreciative of. You know, we started the thing with an idea uh, that was familiar to us and we told a story that was real to us because it was a story that existed, you know, between the two of us. And, and I feel like Will and Grace came out of the purest place. There, was, there wasn't a political motivation, there wasn't a financial motivation, um, and it, 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 was, it was pure creativity. And so, as a result, the, the payoff and all of the things that have come with it, and, and, and some of these labels and what people want to put on us and say that we're responsible for, I mean, it's all great, but it's not what we, we started out uh, mm -hmm. doing you know it's not it wasn't the the objective so it was a purely authentic creative burst yeah. yes and tell me what did inspire will and grace um well there was uh, this relationship that i had in high school uh with with uh the woman that i was meant to marry when i was uh, uh i was in the closet and there's this woman that people seem to know now her name's janet eisenberg she lives in new york and uh, we had a fabulous relationship, and it was uh, the, the basis for the Will and Grace relationship. And, and we always loved that relationship in that the relationship between a gay man and uh, a straight woman, it, it's got so much going for it. It's very safe. It's very open. There's all of the good things that come from uh, a male-female relationship can exist, and none of the things that cause problems like sex mm -hmm. and money, mm -hmm. you know, these are the things that get in the way of it. And and um, uh, we thought, well, we needed to tell a love story. We did have that uh, uh, directive. You 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 guys, you writers, have to put a love story on the air. David Cohen, uh, uh, when we were younger and we were just hanging out, he worked for Sidney Pollack, uh, the great film director Sidney Pollack, and Sidney always, you know, we would go and visit, and Sidney would always say that a love story is over uh, after the kiss, the, the, the movie's over, and it, it would really be up to you two as writers, if, you're, if your objective is to keep a television show on the air as long as possible, you've got to find an obstacle that is overcomable. And, you know, we looked in our own backyard, which was this gay straight relationship, you know. There's a deep love there, but ultimately it can never 
even get to the kiss, let alone get past the kiss, you know? So we had a love story that we would be able to reinvent week after week after week and, and, and uh, look at all of the different levels of a relationship without kind of exploding it and then it's over, you know? Yeah, I think that that's true. When it, I remember on Cheers, when they finally kissed, it's, it's like something yeah. went out of it. All of the tension yeah. is gone. And, and, you know, I mean, I think for... There, there, there's, there's half of the audience that wishes that, that it will happen. Half of the audience knows that it will never happen. And they wish that Will will somehow succumb yes. to Grace's beauty yes. and go straight. Right. And, and the and, other half... And you'd be surprised how often, you, you know, I'm asked in interviews, when will it happen? And I, 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 I always say that, you know, the, same, the day that my eyes turn blue. Because <laughs> it's, it's just not... It's just amazing to me it, it says so much about the the uh, reporter that's interviewing us at, at that time to ask such a question when is will finally going to give in mm -hmm. and be with grace i love that mm -hmm. because i've been I'm, I'm able to live on that notion <laughs> you know i mean that notion pays my bills in a lot of ways but but it's really it says a lot about where uh americans understanding uh where where it where it is in terms of the, the gay man and the gay women or what homosexuality is in 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 our body or what it is to us what is your relationship to will hmm. is he a big part of you and is our will and and jack iconic are they two parts of the same man? I, I, I don't, like, again, all of the labeling of, of referring to Will or Jack as iconic, I don't think that's my job, mm -hmm. you know? I, then I start to take myself a little too seriously, and I think I've got to be very careful to not get to that place where I start referring to them that way, you know? But are they a part of me? Absolutely. Were they originally written as one body yes because i feel like uh, i embody a lot of the qualities of will and a lot of the qualities of jack but i thought and david thought that it would be overload that would that it would actually be too much and and we felt like the audience would accept more if we kind of distributed um personality you know characteristics uh and we put put them in two different corners jack kind of embodies the campier wilder sensibility that exists in a lot of gay men um and 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 as for will's uh, integrity and sense of morality and his position in the world i think that that's always been there but that was that was the part that people weren't putting on tv you know yeah tell me about the day you pitched it uh, well, we went into Warren Littlefield's office to pitch uh, um, a story about a couple that lived in San Francisco, and they were. Uh, we wanted to tell the story of a man and a woman where the woman was stronger and the the guy was a little more docile, and the, and the woman uh, was making all of the decisions in 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 uh, in the relationship. Uh, uh, again, something that, that audiences really aren't that comfortable with. They don't want to see kind of the ball-busting chick running the house, and even though I think that that's going on everywhere, but we haven't figured out a way to tell that story where, it's, where it works. And they had these neighbors, Will and Grace, and Will and Grace seemed to have it all going right. They, they knew how to be in a relationship. They knew how to behave. They knew how to take care of each other. And we used them. They were what eventually Jack and Karen turned out to be for Will and Grace, you know. And as we started talking about these neighbors, Will and Grace, in this pitch, Warren Littlefield, who is responsible for so much of, of, of this show being here today, said, you know, you guys seem to be very comfortable with these neighbors, Will and Grace, this gay guy and this straight girl. I, I think that that would be a, a lot more interesting for you to write what you know. And the, the other characters seem to be uh, less familiar to you. So why don't you go off, write those, write those two, make that, make that your series, and then come back, and then let's talk again. And we went off, and we wrote uh, the pilot for Will and Grace, and, and looking back on it, we really know now how, how as, as my grandmother would say, how beshert the whole thing was, you know, because we wrote the show effortlessly. And we wrote uh, these two characters that we knew very well. We brought it back to NBC, and they said, we like this, let's do this. And, uh, uh, and then we went about making this series. I owe a, lot, a great deal to Ellen, and I don't ever want to take anything away from that. I have to be very careful in the way that I reference her in all of this, because 
I did learn I did learn some things not to do from Ellen. As much as she opened it up and she let America look at this and it was very sensational and very exciting for all of us. My personal opinion is that she did something that we've tried to uh, not do here the, for the run of Will and Grace and that's I think that she started to teach in the following weeks after the coming out episode. That episode was brilliant. I thought it was pitch perfect. She deserves everything that she got as a result of it. But in the following weeks, I think that she started teaching audiences about the dynamics of homosexuality and what goes on inside the world and, and how we handle our parents. And, and it wasn't a baby step. And we take baby steps around here, and we still do, and we don't teach. That's not the way it goes. It's one of the reasons that, I, you know, we have never been able to successfully tell a story about AIDS or HIV. And, it, and it's very frustrating to me as a gay man that we haven't hit that yet. But the reason is we can't find a way to tell that story uh, uh, where we're not teaching a lesson to America mm -hmm. about... Here's how you should handle HIV. Here's how you should handle someone with AIDS, you know? The thing that you always said to me was, this is entertainment. Yeah. That's our first and foremost job, yeah. and you have never come off yeah. a soapbox. Yes. Um, tell me, what were, what's the criticism that you got, even if it irritated you from the gay community? What were they on you about after the joy, the initial joy of the first couple of seasons? Um, there, were, there were two things, um, uh, one, one more so than the other. Uh, uh, Will not being in a real relationship, Will not actually uh, exhibiting the, the, the stuff of love, if you will, you know? And I would always answer that in the way that, I, that, 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 that I've run every show. I don't really feel like it has a place or a home in, in this, this genre. I'm not very comfortable with it, uh, whether it's man, woman, or goats. I don't want to really see bedroom scenes because, I, uh, to go back to what you were saying, I think this is about entertaining and I think this is about getting lost in the fun of this half hour. It's a comedy. And I just, I just again, never felt like we could do it without having um, the audience not be comfortable. And I want, I'd rather them be comfortable. I always looked at this thing as we wrote it like, I handled it like uh, I handled the coming out to my family. You know, I want the audience to be as comfortable as I made my family uh, when, I, when I first came out. And I really do feel like that's been my job. Well, let's go back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you were as a little boy. And your mother raised you and your brother yeah. as a single mom. Yeah. And she took up in the entertainment world, work for Paramount yeah. and Barry Diller. Yes. And so you're just this little kid. Yeah. And you're running around the entertainment industry. Yeah. So did it demystify it for you as a child? Oh, I think it ex totally ignited a passion and a fire in me about show business. I mean, because we were, ju I always felt as, as a closeted gay kid. Um, and I like that we're saying now kids are closeted, you know, it's like because it, it, it really, that's a shift. That's a really good shift to say that kids are closeted now because you never think of it that way, you, you know. Now they're dealing with this stuff that, you know, men that are 30 and from my generation dealt with, you know. I'm glad they should deal with some pain at 15, you know. It, it, it's good that way. Um, I, I was, we were just always on the outside of all of it, you know. My mom was just enough inside that I had access to see these things, just enough that I could be on s sound stages and watch run-throughs of, you know, everything from Laverne and Shirley to uh, um, Little House on the Prairie, all of these shows of, of, of my youth. And I loved it. I loved every second of being on those sound stages. And I thought, someday I'm going to find a way to make that my, uh, you know, my life and my home. Did you know you wanted to be a writer? Or did you just want to create? I don't think so. I mean, I think, like you know, uh, like every good gay boy, I wanted to be a performer. And, <laughs> I was and you know, say, I mean, like... I think that that's what you want to do at the beginning because you don't really know how to focus it, and that's the thing that's there in front of you. And then as I as I grew up, I realized I I didn't really have that that chop. I, I couldn't I couldn't pull that off. I mean, I would have loved to have been an actor, but but one of the best things that ever happened to me was my ability to, you know, uh, self-reflect and, and see what was, what was best for me and what, 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 
what looked good on me, and, and acting wasn't one of those things. And so I, I, I started to focus on the making of, and, and mm -hmm. from that, you know, I kind of grew into writing, and, and hopefully from here I'll, you know, be able to direct stuff. Tell me about um, coming out to your mother. Uh, everything's about kind of living the truth and not wanting to lie at a certain point. I mean, we've said it on the show when, when uh, uh, Will at one point says to Jack uh, when it's time for him to come out to his mother, you know, aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of just keeping it up, you know? And I think that that's what I got to at that point in my life. I came back from college and I just, I was so exhausted from covering lies and making sure that, uh, you know, I said the same things to the same groups of people, but uh, uh, it just became too much for me to, to, to handle. And I came back and uh, uh, we were um, at home uh, having dinner on a Sunday night and I knew that, that it was time and my brother was away and we were alone and I thought, you know what, this is, this is the time. I'm going to do this because I cannot perpetuate this lie anymore and I and uh, I tried to do it and I couldn't get it out luckily the same you know w one week later seven days later we're sitting on the same couch watching the same television program and I just turned to her and I said but it, it, it really speaks to it is such a, a thing for a young man to do I think it is one of the bravest things I will ever do in my life because you're 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 doing what you think is 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 uh, the most unnatural thing in the world. You, you are telling your mother something that you think that she is going to completely reject in you. And and I had to be at the point in my life where I was ready to be rejected. That was that was also what was going on for me. I was finally comfortable enough that if the reaction was the absolute worst reaction uh, uh, that you could think of, I was going to be ready to be on my own in my life. And it spoke to a comfort level, and I think that, that that's where I had to be in order to do it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I turned to her and I said, you, you know, the way that I phrased it was, Mom, I'm not going to be um, marrying Marcel. Why? Well, I think that I'm uh, bisexual, right? <laughs> we all take that half step. And then, but I just, but then I, that didn't even feel good you know, uh, in the moment. And then I said, actually, I, I'm not ever going to marry Marcel. And the reason why is because I'm not bisexual. I'm gay. And you need to know that because I can't, I can't hold on to this anymore. And um, my fabulous, fantastic mother, you know, looked at me uh, without missing a beat and said, is this why you always have had stomach aches? And... Um, it was in that moment that I really just like emotionally kind of let my guard down. I think I was so uptight getting myself to that moment. And, and that spoke to an understanding of, of, of my mother and, and that she knew what this must have been like, you know, to hold on to something like this. And, oh, my God, that's why you've been so uncomfortable for so long, you know. It was such a warm conversation. And, and she said to me, what do you, how do you want me to handle the family? And I said, I want you to do just that. I want you to handle the family because I just, I'm not up for this. What would you tell a young Max today? Say um, a 15-year-old. Well, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's always about being unapologetic about your existence and who you are. And I, I did a good job of kind of creating a world around me where I never had to apologize for anything. And I certainly have this monster now to back me up. So it's like my confidence is pretty high in this department. But, but it, it, it's, it's having a sense of self and be as self-possessed as you possibly can. And don't let the fact that you, you happen to be gay, that your sexuality is gay, don't let that define you. There, there's so much more to you, you, you know. The, the heads of state and the superstars of the world that are uh, uh, heterosexual, I don't think that they define themselves by their sexuality. I think they define themselves by their art or, or, or by their gifts, their ability to sing or play or draw. And I, and, I, and I would always just encourage that from a young person. Just be tapped into that. It's not about being gay. That doesn't have to be the main drive. I think that that's what so many... I think that that's what saves a lot of people too out there. It's what, what you know, those kids that are living in rural parts of this world, and what do they have other than uh, they see on TV a gay image and they're like, "Well, I'm that. Mm -hmm. I know that I'm that." 
but I unfortunately I don't think that there are good reflections. There aren't a lot of good reflections. I think Will is one, you know. That's true. Um, now, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I remember you and I working kind of in collusion on GE. Yeah. Uh, they did not have domestic partnership coverage. Yeah. And um, at the Human Rights Campaign, we have a very broad uh, yeah. corporate program, yeah. and I had been sort of working deep, deep background. Yeah. You helped me kind of up front with NBC. And then they acquired um, Bravo and Telemundo yeah. and altered their policies. And anyway, um, I could see that. I could see the nervousness in you and the passion to drive to correct something sitting right beside each other. That that was, and that's the thing that I really haven't talked about that much. And I, I there was never any problem with what was going on and, and what we were putting out in mm -hmm. terms of product, but there were things that were... Uh, problematic internally. It was a very, very uh, frustrating and upsetting thing to be a part of a company that was, um, you know, uh, an owner of a billion dollar entity that was supplying jobs to a lot of people, but they actually didn't uh, back it up with domestic par uh, partnership benefits. And that was, um, it was shameful. It was actually shameful. But what was I going to do? And what was I really, what, where, how far was I willing to push it? I, is it a matter of me holding on to a tape before uh, a Thursday night viewing and holding on to the master and a negative and say, I will not put this on the air until you, you, GE, tell me right now, publicly in front of Elizabeth Birch uh, of the human rights campaign that you will uh, uh, create domestic partnership uh, benefits. It, I mean, that, but, was a, but, that, was a, that was a tough thing to, to be the... Not, yeah, and that's not the way it usually happens anyway in corporations, that no. someone has to be... I mean, I thought But isn't you that played... the way that the big changes always kind of happen? I mean, you know, I mean, see, that's where, that's where mm -hmm. I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of, of, of change, in terms of uh, gay and lesbian policy yeah. in the world, I, I, I'm starting to feel more and more like it's always going to be about one person. And, and so uh, the human rights campaign... Uh, um, they weren't able to do it at that time. I mean, eventually you guys made it happen, but I was, I had to live with that shame of like, oh, Jesus. Oh, I'm... the GE thing? Yeah. The... Oh, yeah, it happened within a year. I mean, what we did is, remember, we worked with the unions, yeah. and we engineered it, and I actually feel differently about the way change happens in the corporate workplace yeah. than in the world. I think you're right that it ends up being about one person. But you cannot, this is where you and I, and you have an evolving yeah. view, yeah. you cannot build Israel with one person. No. You have to have an army of people, and then you have moments like Cindy Sheehan right. sitting in Crawford. Why? Because she can do no other. Yeah. That she is compelled to be there or like Judy Shepard finding her voice. Why? My example that I used with you is Gavin Newsom. And yeah. you, and you I, because I, I said, I, I had a phone call with you where I talked about, isn't it really just about the Gavin Newsoms of the world? That, that what are we doing putting our money into these large gay and lesbian lobbies or, and, 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 and supporting them? And, and are they, do they ultimately make, make the change? Or is it Gavin Newsom that does that? Or is it Judy Shepard that does it? You would argue that it's the people behind Gavin I would Gavin say you have them both. Yeah. If you don't have an infrastructure, I think Judy Shepard, if she were here, she would say, Max, they, fa they gave me my voice. I had it, but they showed me, you know, the labyrinth uh, of what you need to do to communicate with America. Right. And, you know, it's like saying you could put Eric McCormick on the street yeah. and he could say, I'm an actor, I've paid my dues, and I'm going to now perform for you, America this character will. Right. Or you can put him inside of an infrastructure that sends it out to middle America. Yeah. And I think that it's a little bit of a false dichotomy. I frankly think Gavin Newsom did an amazing thing. But I also think that I'd like to know who the clerk is in the middle of New Mexico and the one in, um, in, in, in rural New York that really put their lives on the line. Gavin Newsom is in a incredibly gay city. Yes. In a state that if he doesn't have gay support to ultimately, I hope he runs for president. 
Yeah. But you know what will make them possible for run for president? There'll be a massive investment. But I do think we're in a time of backlash. And But the clerk you know. in, New, in New Mexico or, or the mayor in upstate New York, they, they, they ultimately uh, had to have a moment that was personal sure. and it, it, where, where they decided to, 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 to make that step and, and do it on their own. And I don't know. I'm, well, I'm so what if it's true that we're doing it all wrong anyway and what we should really be doing <coughs> is empowering uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender youth in a kind of an America Youth Corps yeah. that will go out and do good works in the national forests, building homes, that kind of thing to empower young people that it's all about grassroots. Well, I, I, I think that that's exactly the way that it's going to work. And I, you know, I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to uh, toot my own horn, if you will, mm -hmm. to, to make this point. The, the change that I've made personally uh, from the time that I met you to this point in my life is that I am much, much more focused on the individual and much, much more focused on education of gay, uh, men and women and transgender youth. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's where I think the future, uh, the future for the cause lives. And um, so I've, I've taken the money that I had been using and I hope you don't, I hope this isn't offensive to you, you know, that, I, that I'm talking about, you know, pulling back from places like the human rights campaign. Well, you're pulling back from mainstream American politics, which is not unusual in our time. Yeah, I mean, a, yeah. there is a huge disappointment I mean, over I, 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 the 2004 election. It broke hearts. I yeah, mean, and, I, and, yeah. I, and I could very easily return. But right now, mm -hmm. the place that I'm focused is on education. And so what I did was I started a, a, a scholarship with the help of a very good friend of ours. And I uh, um, am putting gay kids through, through my That's school. Yeah. And, and um, I put it in my name because um, they kind of wanted me to do that and I wanted to do that. Do you want to say the name of the college? So It's so, Everson College yeah. and it's the Max Muchnick Scholarship mm -hmm. and it is available to uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender uh, youth and the truth is, because of the laws that are on the books, it's also available to anybody that supports um, the, the, this cause. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, I will tell you, I, I'm just about to finish uh, a run of the first round that, that, have, that I've taken from freshman year to, to, their, to their graduation, right? And there is something so incredible about seeing these gay kids who have been empowered and have been loved and appreciated and have been told, the world is yours. Go get it. Go make the most of it. Go be, the, go be a self-possessed gay person out there. Feel okay about who you are and um, go make a difference. And I get, I get more from that, that, that connection that way. It's, it's just been better for me. Okay, so now you're 90 years old. Yes. You're rocking on, you know, you're on, you're on Sunset Boulevard, you know, rocking yeah. away, looking out at the world. Um, what do you want your life to have been about, whether it's the gay part or not? Um, uh, I want um, my life to have been about making it a little bit easier for... Um, the gay kid that's about to come out to his mom. I want to feel like I gave, uh, I gave kids that are being hard on themselves a tool that will make it a little bit easier for them. I think that that's, the, that's what I can uh, rest easy with. Okay, thank you, Max Munchnik. Thank you, Elizabeth Birch.